Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is writer Elizabeth Rush, author of Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore, a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize, and author of Still Lives from a Vanishing City, Essays and Photographs from Yang Yang, Myanmar. Yang Gan, Myanmar. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and the Atlantic, among many others. Rush is the recipient of the Howard Foundation Fellowship, the Andrew Mellon Foundation Fellowship for Pedagogical Innovation in the Humanities, and the Science in Society Journalism Award from the National Association of Science Writers. She teaches creative nonfiction at Brown University. Rush gave a talk titled On Rising Together, Creative and Collective Responses to the Climate Crisis on March 5th, 2020, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2019-20 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk was part of the Convergence, Intersections Between the Sciences and Humanities series. Thanks, Elizabeth, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. So tell us about your background and how you ended up becoming a writer. I should say I've been writing for most of my life. I recently moved and uncovered some of my early journals from middle school. So it's always kind of been a part of my, the way I orient myself in the world. I did study creative writing at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and I would say even then I knew that I wanted to write about humans and our relationship to the more than human world. Mm -hmm. I also got the sense that like half the population of Oregon would probably like the same job if possible. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up um, upon graduation moving to Southeast Asia and doing a lot of work for writing for arts organizations and different international magazines and newspapers. And eventually found my way back to the United States and realized that I had kind of built enough of a name for myself that I could start to maybe dictate some of the topics that I wanted to approach. And that's when I made this turn towards environmental writing. So let's talk a little bit about you, uh, the time you spent um, in Southeast Asia and your collaborations with artists there. Tell us about that, project, what you did there. So my first job upon graduation was working for a place called Art Vietnam that worked in service of um, controversial contemporary North Vietnamese artists. So as the country of Vietnam's um, rules around censorship started to relax, you started to see this blossoming in the arts. And so I worked for a foundation that supported those artists. And through that work was ultimately put in contact with a publisher, Things Asian Press. And that publisher asked me if I wanted to start to work on a series of children's books that were bilingual, um, written in you know whatever Asian language the artist was living and working in, um, and English, and would be collaborations that would connect me with some of the artists I'd met through Art Vietnam, but also throughout the region. And so I did a series, probably four or five different children's books that are these collaborations with different, you know, really exciting contemporary Southeast Asian artists. And it was a fun process. Each project was a little bit different. And the artists and I would sort of look at the work they'd already created and see if I could create a story from it. Mm -hmm. And then I would commission a couple additional pieces to fill in the holes. Hmm. And we'd have a children's book on our hands. Fascinating. So. You returned to the United States and you now have, as you say, a reputation and you started to be able to decide what you would write about. So what inspired you to write Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore? So early on, um, sort of in that period of transition when I was reorienting my focus away from Southeast Asia as a writer, I was commissioned to do a story on the India-Bangladesh border fence, which is the longest border fence in the world. Um, I got sent to India and Bangladesh for about a month each to sort of do an on-the-ground reporting in terms of how this fence impacted the lives of folks living in the towns around the border. And one of the things that I found in Bangladesh was that um, a lot of people said the 
the fence is not a big deal. You could bribe your way through. You could sneak your way through under the cover of darkness. The thing that's a really big deal is that saline has started to creep into the aquifer and our crops are dying. Mm -hmm. And so we're having to leave our family land and relocate um, because of sea level rise. And I suddenly started to be able to see that climate change wasn't a problem for the future. It was really with us in the present tense. So when I came back to the United States, um, I started, I thought, if it's happening in Bangladesh, it has to be happening here, but I'm not hearing about it in mm -hmm. the United mm -hmm. States. Um, so I went in search of those stories, and the first place I went to was Louisiana. And, you know, in many ways, the topography of Louisiana is so similar to the topography of Bangladesh. You have this giant um, river system that ends in a delta, and that delta, the land of the delta is usually formed by sort of the buildup of silt that the river deposits. It's very, tends to be very flat and very vulnerable to sea level rise. And so um, my first sea level rise story was about Louisiana. Pretty quickly, I started to write more and more about sea level rise, but I recognized that there were sort of a set of conventions that you had to use to get it into the, to get that story into the newspaper. And I grew bored of those conventions and eventually applied for a grant that would give me some time away from um, having to make my living as a professional journalist. Mm -hmm. And I started to sink into writing rising, which is a bit of a different approach to climate change writing, environmental so, writing. So uh, as a way of helping our viewers understand, would you read a bit? Sure, sure. Um, this is from the opening chapter, The Password. My first summer in Rhode Island, I returned to Jacobs Point Marsh often. One morning, someone else is there. When he and I cross paths, I ask as nonchalantly as possible if he knows why these tupelos are all dead. I'm trying to find out whether he can see what I can, that the precious balance between salt water and fresh that once defined this tidal wetland has been upset. No, the man says, binoculars jangling around his neck. I'm sorry. I'll be the first to admit that before I started coming to Jacob's Point, I couldn't tell the difference between black tupelo and black locust, between needle rush and cord grass. I would learn their names only after I realized the ways in which their letters on my lips might point toward or away from incredible loss. Then I became fascinated. Because unlike Descartes, I believe that language can lessen the distance between humans and the world of which we are a part. I believe it can foster interspecies intimacy and as a result, care. If, as Robin Wall Kimmerer suggests in her essay on the power of identifying all living beings with personal pronouns, naming is the beginning of justice, then saying Tupelo takes me one step closer to recognizing these trees as kin and endowing their flesh with the same inalienable, inalienable rights we humans hold. Sometime during the last half a century, these Tupelo's taproots started to suck up more salt water than they had in the past. They were stunned and stunted. Then they stopped growing. The sea kept working its way into the aquifer. Storms got stronger and dumped more standing water into marshes. And Tupelo's all along the East Coast died. Now they no longer bathe the edges of Jacob's Point in shade. The green coins of their leaves are gone, and a recent bird census carried out in Rhode Island's East Bay suggests that the bank swallows are going too. I tell the stranger all of this, the, sentence, the sentences unspooling fast, like the outgoing tide. Will he shifts from one foot to another, anxious to break away? He has, he tells me, never heard of the tupelo tree. Instead of the luscious rasp of growth on growth and the electric trill of a songbird in flight, out here at the farthest end of Jacob's Point, we are surrounded by the ticking sound of unprecedented heat. Above us, the tupelo's empty, oracular branches groan. 
the oldest living black tupelo in the United States sprouted 650 years ago. That means its first buds burst while the plague was killing off approximately one third of Europe. Now it's the tupelo's turn to succumb in great numbers and the red knots and the whooping cranes and the salt marsh sparrows. Of the 1,400 endangered or threatened species in the United States, over half are wetland dependent. Five times in the history of Earth, nearly all life has winked out, the planet undergoing a series of changes so massive that the overwhelming majority of living species died. These great extinctions are so exceptional, they even have a catchy name, the Big Five. Today, seven out of 10 scientists believe we're in the middle of the sixth. But there is one thing that distinguishes those past die-offs from the one we're currently constructing. Never before have humans been there to tell the tale. The language we use to narrate our experience in the world can awaken in us the knowledge that transformation is both necessary and ongoing. When we say the word Tupelo, we begin to see that both the trees themselves and the very particular ecology they once depended upon are, at least where they are rooted, gone. Sometimes a key arrives before the, before the lock. Sometime, now I'm thinking, sometimes the password arrives before the impasse. These words, when spoken or written down, might grant us entry into a previously unimaginable awareness that the coast and all the living beings on it are changing radically. Thank you so much for me. My so, pleasure. So your emphasis throughout the passage that you just read on the importance of language and story, um, one of the, I think any, anyone who's read any of the recent works on climate change will know that it's difficult to write on climate change in ways that is not extremely dire and depressing. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is a, a, a problem that you confronted when you were writing the book. Say a little bit about how you sought to solve that problem. It's a complicated problem. I think, you know, often the stories that we hear about climate change do register in this apocalyptic sort of narrative as an apocalyptic narrative and part of my resistance to that narrative is that it tells us that the conclusion is foregone that it's already happened that it will happen in exactly this way and i think for a while um a lot of writers and science communicators went to that narrative because they were trying to sound the alarm to say, we have to wake up, climate change is happening, we have to pay attention. And I think that we're actually in a slightly different moment right now. I think that there is a wider, um, much broader amount of climate change awareness. We see this in young people. We see it on the front page of the New York Times. Like we have a lot of um, climate change science stories, conversations, but it all still tends to be super apocalyptic, which shuts down the possibility that we can take real action in the present moment that will have real fundamental impacts on um, who and what we become. And so I think language is a really important mediating factor in terms of how we think about climate change adaptation, mitigation, resilience. Um, some folks will say like, oh, well, you know, we're on a high emissions track and we're cruising towards the worst case scenario. That may well be true, but the difference between 1.7 degrees and 1.8 degrees might not mean a lot for folks who have a lot of resources to sort of help them through that transition, but for plants and animals and human beings living in these border zones, living in the tidal wetlands, that one, you know, point one degree of warming is the difference between this piece of land being underwater and not. You know, I think that we have to take seriously the responsibility that we have to act in the present moment, even for those incremental shifts that it can impact in the future. And I think using language to open up a space for possibility and transformation and action in the climate change conversation, that's something that I'm really interested in.
something I tried to do with Rising. So let's talk a little bit about the form of the book, because mm -hmm. it's an unusual form. So it has alternating sections of your own lyrical writing, and I, and I should emphasize, and I think it's clear from the passage you read, what a lyrical writer you are. I mean, how poetic your prose is. Um, so there's those s lyrical passages about your experiences researching the book, and then sections narrated by your, uh, the people you call the witnesses, the mm -hmm. people who you interviewed in these specific zones. Tell us w w how you came to that form and why that form made sense for you. So, oh, there's so many great stories about how I came to that form, but I think as I address those, I also want to say probably for me, as I research this book, one of the most interesting things one of the things that most transformed me was sitting in the living rooms of folks living on the front lines of sea level rise and flooding that comes with climate change and hearing them talk about not only their personal experiences with flooding, but also what they chose to do with that knowledge. So as I thought about putting rising together, and it's really rising in the sense of rising seas, but also rising into awareness, rising into action, rising into power. Um, I started to realize I wanted the stories of people who lived in places that didn't necessarily have a bunch of property taxes funding innovative infrastructure solutions. I wanted to know what you did as climate change changed your life when you had to make those decisions on your own and with your community members. and. I found the, the decisions folks made really inspiring, you know, coming together as a group and fighting as a neighborhood and asking the state to purchase and demolish their flood prone homes so that residents might move away from risk permanently and that that land be held as open space in perpetuity to act as a buffer in the storms to come, but also be a place where you can visit nature within the city. I mean, those are really radical decisions and ones that we don't often hear about in the climate change conversation today, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it's that's what I was hearing sort of on the front lines of this problem. So those testimonies are partly about saying, you know, these residents know a lot more about what it's like to emotionally, spiritually, economically navigate this problem. I don't want to render their stories through the lens of my own experience, I just want to hand them the microphone because I think that they have really powerful voices on their own. So that's kind of how those came into play. So as you've already made clear, the, a lot of the people that you interviewed are coming from low-income, marginalized communities. How did you gain their trust? Time. I would say time is probably the most important factor. A lot of um, there's sort of a tradition in journalism called like parachuting into a community. Yep. Mm -hmm. You parachute in, you parachute out, you get your story and you leave. Mm -hmm. And as I was writing like the grants to do the research for a lot of these chapters, my biggest budget line was always, uh, you know, I don't want to stay in a fancy hotel. I don't want m fancy meals. I'll stay in a trailer. I'll camp but I want you to pay for that camping spot for two months, you know? And in some cases, I mean, probably a third of the chapters are also communities that are somehow pretty close to me. So the Staten Island chapter, I taught at the College of Staten Island for mm -hmm. three years, and I really spent three years researching that chapter. Mm -hmm. So time showing up again and again, and also trying to come into a community as vulnerably as I possibly could, as unencumbered by the privilege that I have as I could. So I would walk, I would bike. Uh, every place I went, I did door knocking. You know, I didn't want to come in, talk to the, I don't know, uh, neighborhood community president, and then only talk to the people who are important in that community. I tried to really cast a wide net and do that by you know, walking every single street in a community and trying to meet all the residents on that street and then building relationships over time with, with each of those people. So you've mentioned, you're, you just mentioned your, your time in Staten Island because you were teaching there, and that is one of the places where you, you, you alluded to their decision collectively to lobby the, the state to buy their properties. And 
this is a an example. Uh, you you see you um, you see this as a kind of example of managed retreat. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the importance of managed retreat and whether you think that's a scalable solution. So. To me, you know, managed retreat is important for multiple reasons. Um, one of the chief reasons being that if we think about that passage that I read, 50% mm -hmm. um, of our wetland species, 50% of our endangered species live in wetlands. We know that wetlands can migrate up and in as sea levels rise. The major thing that gets in the way of them doing that right now is the fact that we've built along the back side of them. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if we want to think of a real egalitarian climate change adaptation strategy, what we have to do as humans is get out of the way of the 50, pr these endangered species that want to move up and in as tides get higher and storms get stronger. Um, that's part of the reason why I think managed retreat is so important. Is it scalable? You know, yes, but not in the way that we currently approach it. So if you look, um, just last year, one of the first systematic studies of FEMA's managed retreat program came out, and we see that between um, 1989 and today, the length of the program, they've purchased 43,600 homes, which sounds like a lot. But if you look at the projections for how many people in this country will live below high tide in 2100, and you try to, it's in the millions, I forget that exact factor right now, but what I do remember is that at our current rate, it would take us 9,015 years to move all those people. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we do manage retreat and we buy out, you know, 10, 20, 100 properties at a time. We really have to think about how do you make this accessible and um, implement, able to be implemented at a broad scale. I have some thoughts on that. It is possible, but it's not replicating what we have in place currently. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, interestingly, there's a couple bottlenecks to manage retreat that we see. So. Often it's wealthier communities mm -hmm. that get the money to relocate after a storm. That's because those communities usually have in place um, a public servant who can oversee the process and apply for the funding from FEMA. So one, I think that we need to um, start to fund a suite of offices nationwide that specifically focus on managed retreat so you don't have that bottleneck. Um, so that folks in rural, lower income communities will have someone fighting on their behalf to get access to these funds. I think another thing you could think about doing is um, we have the National Flood Insurance Program. It currently requires that if you flood and you make a claim, you rebuild in place, yeah. which is totally insane yeah. in the present moment. Um, I think that you could introduce a clause into that where you say, uh, we'll give you a reduced rate on your flood insurance. Because we also, I should say as a, as a side note, the National Flood Insurance Program has heavily subsidized rates. So most people who live in the floodplain pay a lot less than the actuarial risk of their home. We're talking they might pay $1,000 a year and the actuarial risk of insuring their home is ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year. The National Flood Insurance Program is in billions of dollars of debt. They're removing those subsidies and we're starting to see that economic financial pressure transferred onto homeowners. So what if you said you can keep your subsidized rate, but when your home floods, you agree to be part of a managed retreat program. So you start to get out sort of ahead of these storms and get people thinking about what it might mean to move away from risk and then you fund that through the program that's, you know, hemorrhaging money to rebuild along our vulnerable seashore, you know, presently. So it might be kind of kill two birds with one stone, but it also means just having a public conversation around managed retreat in the first place. Hmm. So we're, our time is clicking by. I have so many questions to ask you, but I will, I want to ask you about this. So last year you went on an expedition to Antarctica as the National Science Foundation's Antarctica artist and writer. <laughs> 
Tell I, us about that. I did. Um, gosh, the it was an incredibly transformative experience. I spent two months on an icebreaker traveling to the calving edge of the Waits Glacier, which has been nicknamed by the dooms nicknamed the Doomsday Glacier by the news media because it alone has the potential to raise global sea levels up to 14 feet. Um, there's a lot of really important science that's taking place around this glacial system. Um, and because of its sheer remoteness, no one had ever been to where we went uh, during in the history of the planet. Because of its sheer remoteness, we just don't have a lot of observational data. So I got to be part of this team of scientists on this really um, groundbreaking mission. That being said, um, I also think that we often talk about Antarctica from this place of the exceptionalism of the scientist or of the human being who goes and visits it. So tentatively right now, this my next book that I'm writing about the process is written in the second person hmm. and sort of tries to invite readers into the idea that they too can go be a part of creating this groundbreaking science and also ultimately bear witness to the collapse of this really important key glacial system. Hmm. So Elizabeth, we have a minute and a half left, so this is my last question. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you remain optimistic for the next generation? Gosh, the next generation is teaching me how to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably one of the biggest things that's changed in the time that I've been writing about sea level rise is certainly when I started this project, I felt like one of my jobs was to create a more democratic climate change conversation to get more people to participate in it, um, to kick that door open really wide. And in some ways, I think a lot of that has started to happen. And that's in part thanks to you know, the activism of this younger generation that recognizes already that you, know, you can't have uh, green infrastructure without environmental justice, that climate change just deepens the distance between the haves and the have nots, um, and that we have to sort of address structural inequalities alongside this transformation to cleaner, greener energy and infrastructure. And they are, you know, deeply inspirational, walking out of schools, having really complicated conversations with older generations and making demands that I think are spot on for where we need to think about where we ought to go. So I get a lot of my inspiration from them. Well, Elizabeth Rush, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Today, it's been a really interesting conversation. It's a wonderful book. I urge all of our viewers to read it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful speaking with you. I've been speaking with writer Elizabeth Rush, author of Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore, a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize. Rush gave a talk titled On Rising Together, Creative and Collective Responses to the Climate Crisis, on March 5, 2020, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2019-2020 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk was part of the Convergence, Intersections Between the Sciences and Humanities series. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>